Hello there, welcome to a little primer video, uh, which will preface the third chapter of the Dungeons & Dragons 4E Summer of Fun campaign, set to begin in less than an hour. Uh, the reason why I'm recording this is because uh, at the end of the last chapter, uh, chapter 2, uh, the DM gave our characters two days of downtime to do whatever they wanted to do in the city, or the town rather, a sandpoint. And so I've decided to basically cover, uh, like summarize, what Saloro chose to do. I'll even upload some relevant documents to Mediafire and paste them in the video description. I'll also leave them on the screen long enough if you'd like to pause and read them yourself. I'm not going to go through reading everything that uh, Saloro did, courtesy of the fact that, well, I need to save my energy. Rough day, big lunch, uh, I need all the help I can get to carry myself through the session, and... I'm not even a European like all the other players, okay? So uh, the first thing I did was I typed up a sort of, you know, pre-Chapter 3 downtime here thing that uh, I actually typed this up like on Monday night, Tuesday morning. So uh, not that long before, uh, not that long after the end of Chapter 2. Uh, Saloro basically is a highly intellectual individual who uh, I really couldn't do anything uh, after the end of Chapter 1 because we were still in a combat it's, you know, phase, but with uh, some downtime and Saloro's 18 intelligence and my well-educated, you know, talent and mind, you know, decided to see if I could get some more information and uh, draw some conclusions based off of that. Now, Saloro continued to explore... Uh, how the goblins managed to get into the peaceful little hamlet of Sandpoint. You know, uh, shit. We killed uh, at least 21 enemies in the town square alone. Might have been another dozen or two spread out through all Sandpoint. Not sure. What we do know is that, uh, they had to have gotten into the city somehow. There was a small little raiding band that, uh, got into the crypt, uh, area. Uh, by the cathedral to raid the tomb of Azakian Tobin, who was the old priest of Sandpoint before the cathedral fire five years ago in game time. But, uh, I mean, how did they get over? Did they stack on top of each other like a goblin ladder? Did, was a ladder left out for them? Did they make a staircase? Did the large humanoid that was with them just lob them over? How'd they get over us? Is it easy to tell? You know, and similarly, you know, that north gate seems like it'd be pretty conveniently located. Folks might have been distracted during the Swallowtail Festival, try to figure out how the hell they got into the city. Maybe some travelers snuck them in in carts and wagons. Maybe no guards were paying attention. It's hard to say, but there is definitely, you know, a strong reason to suspect that there is inside involvement, or at least uh, someone with personal intimate knowledge of Sandpoint, perhaps standing and even in a position of authority. And, uh, so uh, that was the first section, and uh, Saloro talked with a lot of people, used his fame, used some silver pieces, there you go. The first uh, point was to, uh, you know, try to figure out, you know, why the hell anyone would have cared about raiding the tomb of Ezaki and Tobin, who, as you can see, I didn't fucking think of the name of at the time that I wrote this. Uh, Jonas told me later. And uh, just trying to figure out uh, some history and background and details on the guy, and why anyone would have thought him special enough to target. Because, you know, the whole cathedral fire might have been a personal thing towards that guy as well, since he died in it. You know, maybe I'd figure out something of interest. Uh, Saloro spoke with Sheriff Hemlock, uh, tried to discern more about the, uh, the goblins who attacked. Uh, try to figure out more information about them, maybe uh, tribes around, um, and also to spread the information, the goblins may try something as crazy as a naval insult, assault because, well, they're insane. Uh, and uh, Saloro dove into some gossip as well. You know, Mako Kajitsu, who is the owner, uh, proprietor of the Rusty Dragon Inn, where the party is staying. You know, her father, Longiku, the Skarni gang, we heard about. Um, Whenever we found that crate of stolen goods inside the old light uh, in the last chapter, as well as some political news, I purchased some material components for any of my rituals. 
uh, Soloro devoted some time doing, like, role-playing shit, interacting with, you know, himself and his horse and reflecting upon his live dreams and what have you. So there you go. And as always, of course, I, I do think the, the font is a nice enough size that you can pause and, uh, this is my normal reading font anyway, 14 or, actually I like 16 more. I must have decreased that for some convenience. So yeah, I'll go ahead and scroll through this again if you wanted to pause and read through everything. I will, suppose I'll even upload this to Mediafire as well. If you're that interested in reading. Okay, so there's that. Uh, what Soloro did, uh, for the most part, during the downtime. And then, uh... Uh, the DM, Jonas, sent me this, and this shit is way too small for my eyes. Let's take this up to 16. I don't like this font, either. I like a Palantino Lin type. Can I get that? Yeah, of course this is gonna be a little bit laggy while I'm recording. There we go, that's a good font for my eyes. So, uh, while searching through the town... Uh, Soloro did figure out that there were ladder marks, uh, on the ground both outside and inside the graveyard. Um, we also figured out that no one was overseeing the northeastern gate at all. No one was actually on guard duty. And it's actually the city garrison, so basically what Sh Sheriff Hemlock oversees, uh, who handles the scheduling for that locale. Which, uh, most interesting that so it very well could have been left open during the Swallowtail Festival while, you know, the Mayor Kendra Deverin and uh, ba Baylor Hemlock were speaking, and while uh, Abstellar Xantis was about to. Uh, the old priest's name, um, uh, Jonas informed me, was Azakian Tobin. Uh, seemed to have been universally loved. You know, he's a great guy. He did have a foster daughter by the name of Nualia. Exactly how she came to live with uh, Tobin is unknown. But uh, she's considered special. She had like a celestial radiance and aura about her. Or at least that's what I end up suspecting. It's celestial in nature, given how heavenly she's described. And how much, you know, awesome sauce is bestowed and decreed upon her. You know, her touch was said to have had healing property as well as her hair and tears. You know, she was revered by the townsfolk, and that's pretty fucking awkward. Uh, Sheriff Hemlock gives uh, more of an information dump. Uh, goes into more detail about Chopper. Um, which is uh, stuff that uh, my character already knew going into it. But, you know, just in case, I can sort of recap of stuff. How this serial killer collected trophies. You know, exalted in, you know, completely eviscerating and butchering people, and ended up committing suicide himself. But sure, before Sheriff Hemlock could find him. He, uh, had this curious, uh, eccentricity about him. He was an artist who sort of, like, carved birds. So, uh, that's cool and all. Good job. And his name was Jervis Stute. And he is very much dead, unless Sheriff Hemlock has been lying to us all this time. Uh, there's some information about the Goblin Tribes, which is bad, and apparently it comes from, uh, most of this information comes from a local elven ranger by the name of Shalelu Andosana. I did not write that down on my... I actually have cared so much about this that I've kept a sheet of, uh, paper and to serve as notes for me so I would not have to, uh, flip through so many damn notepads and what have you. Besides, uh, as I learned in elementary school, regrettably, if you have to keep writing things down, you know, you will learn through rote repetition. Hurrah! And this will be, uh, Elven Ranger. Da 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 da. I don't know why that inspired me to think of Indiana Jones. Alright. Uh, Solaro's thoughts of a naval assault, Sheriff Hemlock, you know, thinks it's a little silly, but what the hell ever. There is, uh, some detail between Longiku and Ameko Kajitsu, uh, seems to be a troubled one. Uh, Longiku, of course, is a noble who can oversees the Sandpoint Glassworks, which, glassworking in and of itself is an uncommon practice. They're foreigners. Uh, he did not have a happy marriage, he's actually a cuckold. 
uh, his wife, Atsui, had a romance with an unknown elf. How this was discovered was because the child that resulted from being born was a half-elf. But, uh, you know, he stayed married for 17 years. Uh, Suto apparently left town at 16. The same week the late unpleasantness unpleasant it started. Uh, the wife was found deaf at the cliffs. Apparently she had fallen and broken her neck during an evening stroll. Uh, stuff like that. Again, feel free to pause. I'll go ahead and upload this as well to Mediafire. Uh, House of Blue Stones is open. <laughs> uh, DM is uh, commenting on what I wrote. Now, as it turns out, Solorus ended up sleeping separately from the rest of the party. And a small room uh, that's being kept near the stables. How about that? So, uh, after all this information was traded between me and Jonas, I decided to ask some more information. Let's go ahead and uh, scroll through things. So, uh, I go through and asking about, uh, you know, more details about Nualia. You know, she doesn't sound human, like some sort of celestial descendant type character. And uh, Jonas was like, yeah, the deduction about that certainly seems uh, valid. Described as having had fair skin, silver hair, and almost shining silver eyes. You know, uh, it, though, it did seem like an awkward situation. You know, uh, how she might have felt if everyone had fawned over her. Like, it's sort of awkward, you know. Uh, sort of like a celebrity in uh, our day and age, a major one. And, uh, everyone fawning over you, wanting to spend time with you, wanting to be with you, obsessing over you, can create awkward moments, especially if, you know, you're a child or teenager. Uh, let's see here. I, uh, I clarified for Jonas, I was like, hey, you didn't give me any information about, like, the Scarney gang, uh, any political wins from Magnamar. Jonas goes ahead and details all that. The Scarney gang is... You know, it's a thing. <laughs> Smugglers and thieves, but they take great care of not leaving witnesses. They don't have a whole lot of involvement inside the town itself. Uh, news from Magnamar has, seems thin. Uh, I am reminded about Aldern Foxglove, the guy who we rescued, the noble type whose uh, dog died. I might be able to find out more information from him. I think he's staying at the Rusty Dragon. I don't remember it that well. And I can't exactly check the recording on account of the fact that, you know, I didn't get a full recording of that. Uh, political situation in town. You have people squabbling over things. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There's a romance. dun da da uh, Sir Jasper here, the head of the Sandpoint Mercantile League, has apparently had a romantic relationship with Sirdak Drakus, the proprietor of the Sandpoint Theater. Homosexuality, everyone, in the medieval world, involving a former paladin, no less. How scandalous. So here I am, uh, a pouring, trying to get more details about uh, the day of the goblin attack. Um, there was a speaker who was planned, Lonjiku Kaijitsu. But, you know, he's well known for disliking festivities and gatherings of people, so it's not odd at all. <laughs> Uh, talking about uh, some information and trying to get to the thick of the things. Of course, as I've noted before, now some of you familiar with Sandpoint exists. It's, you know, Jonas has borrowed information from other campaign settings. You know, apparently this, is, this whole Sandpoint realm is a big deal in Pathfinder. I've never played Pathfinder. And uh, I've never, I've never taken a peek at it before. So, don't ruin any details for me, everyone, or I'm gonna block you forever. <laughs> uh, of course, feel free to pause at any moment. This is not something I'm going to upload my Skype conversation for you. Uh, trying to uh, dig into some more information to try to figure out what sort of crazy coincidences there were involving the late unpleasantness. Like, uh, what time, you know, what's the time difference between when uh, Lonjiku's wife, I Atsui, was murdered? And when the first chopper murder was reported, apparently there was not a whole lot of a uh, whole lot of time. Uh, the all of the victims were murdered over the course of one month, and a few weeks passed between the chopper being taken down by Hemlock and the fire at the cathedral. You know, 
And uh, here's me sharing like a, some sort of theory and a, a dawning realization from Saloru that uh, all the events are tied together, not by coincidence. Atsui's death seems like a murder. Uh, the eccentric artist fuck snapping. He might have had some issues exacerbated. Uh, everything sort of knits together in a clusterfuck of overwhelming evil. You know, uh, perhaps this late unpleasantness has to do with some sort of malevolent aura or malaise affecting these people whose emotional personalities might have already been weakened. And so to try to get a little bit more information, maybe, you know, the town was built on some sort of gravesite, or, you know, the founders offended some ancient spirit. Trying to get some more, uh, information. And, uh, Jonas ended, uh, sending me a little bit of history of Sandpoint from that goddamn old man. <laughs> Anyway, that takes care of that. I'll go ahead and share the information that was received from the old man. Which, I will now increase in size. Again, I guess I'll keep it, uh, in Times New Roman. Which, Broder Kink, he's kind enough to divulge it, but it's not really that useful. It's sort of information that was already given to us in our initial info document. So, not a big deal, really. Which is unfortunate. I will say, I will say. Oh, I just thought of something. I don't have the quality set to maximum on this recording. It might be harder to read. Ah, I, I, I usually do that before I start the session, set it to 100 quality. I have it toned down a bit, though, for... Well, maybe I don't. I, I don't think I actually recorded anything else with Bandicam. Whatever, irrelevant. So yeah, we, we, we have a little bit of interesting knowledge, but nothing conclusive either way. It's unfortunate. Nah, I discard him. And so uh, the final document I'll share with you all is uh, what Saloro ended up telling the party. Which, you know, we had a good talk, everyone. Saloro will end up speaking with the rest of the party, which might involve Aranos, too, if the sorcerer just happens to be around the time. In typical Saloro fashion, he will strike when they're grouped together, likely during mealtime, without any obvious eavesdroppers, and he will get to the point. At least one person is working with the goblins who has intimate knowledge of Sandpoint, perhaps an authority figure. Why? The goblins knew how to get into the city. On the day of the attack, there was no guard stationed at the northern gate. Locals and guards alike confirmed this. There had coincidentally been a gap scheduled at the city garrison while the speakers were at the square. It's conjecture, but the gate would have been the easiest way for goblins to get through, particularly they're being smuggled in by others. No one was checking the carts being brought in from the countryside, and you'll recall how we were nearly surprised in the square. In addition, someone also left at least one ladder outside the city wall for the small force of goblins and the larger humanoid to raid the crypt containing the body of Ezekian Tobin, the old priest who oversaw the town before he died in the cathedral fire five years ago. Given the stealth of this small task force and the obviousness of the other goblin sightings elsewhere in the city, I surmise the primary objective of the attack was to steal Tobin's corpse from the crypt. The person or persons responsible for uniting the goblins together must have wanted the body for some purpose, perhaps a religious significance or simply out of vengeance. Who? Insufficient data. However, I think it is whoever is responsible for setting the cathedral on fire five years ago. Indeed, all of the key players are likely native to the locale. The goblins are tools of convenience, the implements of an even greater foe. There is also a mountain of evidence to suggest a confluence in the various events surrounding the small town. For those of you unfamiliar with the area, Sandpoint has been trying to recover from the late unpleasantness that occurred five years ago, primarily sparked by the eccentric artist known as Jervis Stute, the chopper who became so overcome with rage and fury that he murdered dozens of innocents. However, the so-called accidental death of Atsui Kajitsu and the tragic cathedral fire in an otherwise sleepy hamlet would indicate a greater force at work, one that has returned to Sandpoint after these past few years to wreak havoc once more more. After examining historical records, primary documents, and my own dreams, I advise remaining here for longer to observe the situation. While I do not wish to overstay my welcome, it would be worse to leave only for Sandpoint to fall into ruin. And with that, Solaro will pile pile politely not within scaling clothing, leave the rest of the group without preamble to go do wizard things. Okay, everyone! So there you go. And I will package these four up in a RAR file, upload them to Mediafire, and attach them to the video description. Uh, for those of you who are interested in following along, uh, there you go. There's some more information. Because I care enough to spend 20 minutes of my time to do this, for those of you who are following. 
you're welcome. <laughs> Have a good day, everyone.